Welcome back to another episode of the Good Advice Podcast. Hey, if you've been looking for a way to do business better, this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Blake Benz. I've been doing this podcast for about five years now, I guess, and I run a business called Good Advice, which really came about because I was tired of how often people were talking about concepts and theories. And here I was as a business owner thinking, hey, just tell me what I need to do. Like, what do I actually need to do to grow this thing? Thing. So that's the heart and soul of the podcast. Whether you're a longtime listener or a first time listener, you're going to get some good advice today. Today's episode is an amazing one. We have Ben Gutman on the show today. Ben has an incredible background in marketing. He just published a book called Simply Put Why Clear Messages Win and How to Design Them. Let me say this very clearly you need this book. You need to get a copy of this book because I know if you're like me, many of us, we know all the amazing things about our business, but we don't know how to really boil that down into a simple line to actually tell people that makes sense to them. And more importantly, for people who are our customer, we often struggle to talk about it in a, in a compelling way that gets them one step closer to hiring us for our services. All of that is covered on today's show today. Ben was an amazing guest. I think you're going to love this episode. Before we dive in, though, we do have a word from one of the amazing businesses that sponsor the podcast. By the way, if you've been looking at sponsoring and advertising on the show, you can reach out Blake at goodadvicecoaching.com. Of course, if you're on the Patreon, you're going to be able to skip right ahead to the episode's content. And lastly, hey, if you're loving the podcast, don't forget to leave us a review. You can also check us out on Google. You can Google NWA Good Advice and give us a five-star review. It definitely helps us out. All that to say, here's a quick word. We'll be right back. Talk soon. There's one single piece of advice that I give to business owners who are ready to scale their business drastically. And that's knowing exactly what you need to hand off so that you can continue focusing on what you're an expert in. It amazes me when I talk to business owners who are doing their own bookkeeping and tax prep and worse that they're going through all this paperwork at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, even midnight, slaving away, trying to make sense of all of the numbers for their business. Business owners who are making it happen have already figured out that you can't do it all yourself. That's why I recommend Steve Lay with Equity Business Solutions. Not only is he an expert in bookkeeping and tax prep, but what I love about Steve is that he'll sit down with you and help you make sense of the value of your business beyond just reading a spreadsheet. You'll be able to make better decisions, and more importantly, you're going to save yourself the crucial time you would have spent going through QuickBooks or an Excel spreadsheet or whatever it is that keeps us up late at night. So save yourself some time and some money by giving Steve Lay a call at Equity Business Solutions, and he'll show you the value beyond your numbers. Go to EquityBusinessSolutionsLLC.com to find out more. Okay, Ben, you are joining the show. We've already been chatting. I love guests like you, by the way, where I get on the call and immediately it's like, oh my gosh, I could talk to this guy for an hour. Thank you for being on the podcast today. Thanks for having me, Blake. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that when I when we used to run our agency and we would meet with clients, we'd have an hour long meeting, and probably for the first thirty to forty minutes, we had we didn't talk about business whatsoever, right? You're talking about, you know, talking about what restaurants in the neighborhood. You're talking mm-hmm. about the jets. You're talking about whatever. Oh um, man! And so then eventually, you get to the point where it's like, okay, let's let's get that. Yeah, we should probably. <laughs> we should probably. Yeah, that's what I felt like. I was like, we should probably record this episode. Uh, now that we're chatting, so you're based you're based out of New York. Um, so you are a Jets fan. What what, I am. what is what is life like for you, man? Well, I mean, this week when we're recording it, we just beat uh, the Eagles, which uh, I saw that game. Feel wonderful. Yeah, that was, was a wild game. Um, so, uh, but I'll put it this way: uh, my wife and I have been together for ten years. Uh, in those ten years, the Jets haven't made the playoffs. Uh, There's the longest drought of any major North American sports team uh, of not making the playoffs. And uh, it's been not only bad, but it's been like boring bad. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's good bad and there's boring bad. And uh, so I was born into this. It was a really rough experience. Uh, however, I am a Yankees fan and uh, okay. I had a very great childhood yeah. with the Yankees. Sure. Uh, the last few years, you know, hit or miss, depending on you know what's going on. But uh, you know, I can't win too much. I can't lose too much. At least it, I have something in the middle. It keeps you humble. 
right? Yeah. You know, so I'm I think a it builds character to be a Jets. That's fan. right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a Razorback fan, which my, okay. our local, the, we have listeners all over the world, but for the local people, they're going to give me a hard time because I'm actually not a very big Arkansas Razorback fan. And when someone gives me, and, and here in Northwest Arkansas, we have so many, um, uh transplants like people who who come here they're here they're here for a season and they move on you know and i've i've lived in arkansas my whole life almost um and so people are like oh you're not like a diehard arkansas razorbacks fan and i'm like i have seen them lose for 20 years of my life so you know excuse me for not being diehard but it's only because i've been hurt so much honestly but not unlike oh, yeah. the Jets a little bit. So, <laughs> I mean, it was the most Jets thing that ever happened, you know, week one when Aaron Rodgers goes down and the, the it's, it's right. It, it's it's right, incredible. Man. It's yeah. incredible. Um, well, let's, yeah. let, let's talk a bit. So you, you were, um, running a, a marketing agency. Um, mm-hmm. right now you're the principal of Unisphere ideas. You just launched this book, uh, which I want to make sure I, I it's it was said in the intro, but I want to make sure that um, I, I say it again for everybody listening. So the book is called Simply Put, um, and you can get it on Ben's website, bengutman.com. That's G-U-T-T-M-A-N-N.com. Two T's, two N's. Um, ben, I've actually... Uh, so anytime someone comes on the show... Um, I think it's very obnoxious to just be like, who are you? What do you do? Oh, cool. So what's it called? So I, I try to do like at least a little bit. Um, and so we talked uh, a while ago about you coming on and you sent me a copy of the book. I really like it. I really awesome. have enjoyed the book. And and I people who listen to the podcast long term know that I'm a pretty genuine person. I try not to like blow smoke anyway, but I really do mean this authentically. I've I've actually re- I've really which I don't know if this is like a, a low key insult. Like I was surprised, but <laughs> <laughs> it's like when I had like my podcast early on, and people were like, "I was surprised. It was actually pretty good." And I was like, "Oh, is that an insult? I don't know." But um, simply put, why clear messages win and how to design them. Tell me a little bit about. What got you? What got you cooking on writing the book? Like, I gotta make a, I gotta write a book. I gotta do this thing. Um, I'd love to hear the story of that. Oh man, well, I, I really appreciate that because, uh, you know, I this a book is a long project, right? A book is this is something that started about a year and a half ago in terms of the actual like, production of the book. It's obviously something that is, you know, my whole career has has uh, built towards in terms of the experience from the agency, the experience from teaching, uh, and so. When it comes out, which it came out a week ago, uh, a week ago today, the to hear people say that uh, it means the world. I really appreciate it, and uh, and it is high praise because you know you've you, you know what you're talking about in this in this space, obviously, um, and you've encountered what I have also known in my life, which is there's lots of people that write some sort of business book just for the sake of saying yeah. they wrote a book, right? And they yeah. And, and right. you know, nothing wrong with that necessarily. I know people who you know are very smart that have done that, um, but I uh, I wanted to make sure it was also a good book, right? I, I was really uh, you know kind of dedicated to making sure this was well researched. This is something that uh, was well written, um, and you know I, I'm glad to hear that that's been resonating, which I really appreciate. It it is well researched, by the way, because I think I think sometimes the You've nailed it, by the way. I think sometimes people write books because it really is just a sales tool, which again, mm-hmm. for our listeners, uh, no- nothing wrong with that. I- I'm talking about, though, in terms of like imparting quality insights, mm-hmm. um, that's really clear in your book. And then you mentioned doing the research. Um, and I-, I apologize that I'm doing this because I'm about to say something that I can't actually point to the specific instance, but um, there's been a couple of great uh, details, uh, studies you've mentioned in the book. Um, one of the ones that I had just read about was, um, a study you mentioned about people not being willing to unlock their phone and give like free access, <laughs> but then actually oh, yeah. doing that. Uh, and then there was another study that I originally told you about when we were chatting about you coming on the podcast and it, it escapes me, but point being though, you, you have done your research. It's not just, you know, um, I guess rambling, which is typically oh, yeah. me on my podcast, but <laughs> well, that that was uh, important for me when I that was like my table stakes when I was figuring out if I wanted to write the book and, and do uh, was it needed to be something that was correct, right? It, it it couldn't just be war stories. It needed to be something that was backed <laughs> up by by yeah. science and statistics and history and all this other stuff. Uh, you know, and what what's so you mentioned a couple pieces of my bio there. I also I teach at Baruch College here in New York. Uh, I've been doing that for about 10 years. I love it. It's the best thing. If anybody's ever thinking about teaching, go do it. It's the best. 
but because of that, I have access to all of these great academic databases. Mm. Uh, and that was so fun to dig through it. It's, you know, it sounds really nerdy to be like, it's so fun to look through the academic databases, but I really <laughs> did. I really enjoyed being able to pull the actual science yeah. behind this stuff. Um, and that was interesting because there ended up being this contrast between the sources that I got from that and the sources that I found otherwise, or the stuff I was trying to find otherwise, uh, where I realized the internet in many ways is a lot worse today than it was five years ago or 10 years ago, where it's just hard to find stuff. Mm -hmm. There's so much, I mean, right now we're dealing with the deluge of AI stuff that's going on, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, even before that, we're talking about, you know, a, a generation's worth of SEO bait that's been piled on the internet. Um, and every time I would try to find something like a statistic about literacy, it would take me three hours because I would find, I would Google it. I would find something, but it, it wouldn't have a great source. And I would go somewhere else. And I would just see that that sourced an infographic somewhere, which sourced a Facebook post, which, and then yeah. eventually, you know, circles around. And so whenever you see something on the internet that is just a statistic or a quote or something that gets repeated over and over again it's probably not true it's probably and so when, when i eventually start getting down to like the original sources there everything was just taken out of context and it wasn't the right information so it would take three hours to go find a statistic that was from like a government report that was reliable that was up to date uh, and that i felt comfortable putting in there and that would make up like half a sentence Right. And yeah. so, um, and, and that is a really tough thing. And I, I, I realize, um, you know, that that's going to, that if that's a problem for me in this kind of, you know, deliberate effort to write something, anybody that's just saying, Hey, I need to quick, you know, quickly look something up. Uh, it's, we're, we're screwed. I mean, yeah. to be honest, in terms of finding the truth. Yeah. And I, I've had that issue too, because I, I do a lot of um, solo episodes on the podcast or write a lot on LinkedIn and I'll I'll find a data point, like exactly what you said, like a study, like a government or like a SBA study, whatever it is. And then when I try to find the original study to like read about it, I, I cannot find it anywhere. And it really mm -hmm. is like, it's an in, 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 infographic on some random page that referenced the small business administration. And I'm like, where, where is the info? Um, so I, you make a great point. So, so what, what, why was it important to you though, to put in, you know, the hours of work for that single sentence? I mean, obviously it mattered to me. I mean, Tom, we're talking about it. I was like, because I it like matters it. to you, right? Yeah, that's I guess why. that's it, right? I'm answering my own question, but you know, it's interesting though, and maybe this is a, an interesting conversation to have about like marketing in general. Um, it feels like going that extra mile. It, it, I don't know how immediately you get rewarded for it. I mean, we're talking about it now. You went the extra mile. You had a you had um, a standard for how you wanted to write this. Um, let's let's talk about marketing a little bit because yeah. marketing in general, and you even mentioned AI, it feels like there is much of this path of least resistance. Um, what's the shortest path to creating content? Or uh, I, even, even I was talking to someone the other day who um, she just published a book and I was like, well, what's the process like? And she was like, honestly, ChatGPT wrote most of it. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, well, there you go. So so talk to me about like this tension in the sense of like how you've kind of you've kind of stuck to your guns and like appreciated quality versus a world that seems to be becoming more and more mass generated. Um, mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think I got what you're saying. The, the thing about um, the quality that was why it was important to me uh, was because I'm going to put my name on it. It's going to, you know, you're going to spend you're going to spend your time reading it and someone's going to spend their money buying the book and and all these things i wanted to respect everybody in the process and i wasn't just going to be throwing something out there for the sake of of throwing something out there so that that's personally why it was um also because in in my experience my marketing agency that i ran for 10 years um we worked with a lot of authors over the years and uh it was a great honor i, I there are some folks that um sold a bajillion copies of their books we worked with and there would be a difference that we would see in the business space there are basically three types of authors in, in the business space there are uh, executives or entrepreneurs there are uh, journalists and there are academics uh, 
the books by executive, they're all hit or miss to different degrees, but the books by executives tended to lean towards like war stories and anecdotes. And there's some really interesting memoir type stuff out there. That's great. But it sometimes ends up being a little too kind of um, uh, self-congratulatory and right. in, in yeah. right? a, mm-hmm. a little too much like, you know, look at this, you know, the the, the big game trophy I got and this big right. deal or whatever. Right? Yeah. Uh, the stuff by journalists tended to be some of the best writing, but it would also be uh, sometimes a little shallower on the content. Mm-hmm. Uh, you would have some good ideas in there, but it would be maybe spread out, like one good idea spread out over the course of like several long anecdotes to to fill out a chapter or a section of the book. Uh, and then the stuff by academics would often be some of the harder stuff to read because the writing would be a little bit tougher, but mm-hmm. it would be it would feel the truest if that makes sense because there was a higher level of of um a higher bar to cross in terms of standards for stuff now i i i toe the line a little bit between some of this i'm not an, i'm not an academic researcher so i'm not i'm not someone like adam grant who's who's writing their own who's doing their own research and stuff but you know by being in the classroom for the past uh you know past 10 years doing right. that I do feel a certain level of responsibility to to um, at least honor that that angle of things and i also didn't want to just write about my agency i I enjoyed running our agency it was great but i didn't want to i didn't feel like that was a story worth telling in in in, in this venue um so uh that's one piece and to answer the other part of your question which is what do you do about uh this kind of deluge of of chat gpt generated stuff Uh, (laughs) it's interesting man it is a this chat gpt came out right as i was finishing the first draft of this book uh, and I was like, great. Oh, you know, I'm going to use this to help me research something, talk yeah. about that research problem. Yeah. And I go and I ask, hey, you know, can you give me some studies that are about topic X, Y, Z? Uh, and it goes and it spits out a list. I'm like, oh, this is great. And I take that list and I dump it into the database or I, 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 I copy it into the search bar and it, studies don't exist. The authors exist and they've done some stuff in that similar space. Those titles sound plausible. But mm. those authors that never worked together, that ty- that study doesn't exist because it was hallucinated. It looks like the right answer. And that's yeah. what it that's what these like generative AI tools are really good at, at least for right now, is producing stuff that looks like the right answer. Uh and you know, like you know, to your to your your uh friend that was writing this book via Chat GPT, if you just need a physical book, if you just need to get 40,000, 50,000 words out somewhere yeah. on a Kindle thing. Yeah, I mean, it'll do it for you, but it's not going to produce anything interesting necessarily. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about yeah. the book specifically. How, how did you choose this topic? Um, I, I love this topic, by the way, which which uh, the book is more expansive than just talking about clarity. But h- how did you land on this topic of clarity? Why clarity? Um, I'd love to hear the process of that. Certainly. The uh, So... Through all these different experiences, through teaching, through running an agency, through just being a user of the world, a consumer of the world, uh, I would see the same thing happen over and over again, which would be people who have a great thing. It's a great idea, a great product, a great movement, and they they want to get traction on it. They want to get people mm-hmm. to buy their stuff or to vote for them or to donate. Uh, and they'd have a hard time. They'd have a hard time kind of spitting it out. And this is not unique. This is what people hire a marketing agency for, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, is they have a thing, they want people to to go get the thing. And when you're in the thick of it, when you're running the business, you can intuitively understand stuff just based off of experience of what you've done. Uh, but it's harder to kind of take that step back and understand the why of it and understand you know how you can equip other people to do that. And so once I sold the business, I was able to to still kind of noodle on this question, which was why do some messages work when others don't, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, kind of the base level question about marketing or advocacy or whatever. Why do some messages work when others don't? Uh, And it turned out when I was able to, to look into it, that the answer was simple. It was literally simple. Uh, And by the way, I I say this in the like first page of the book, if that's enough that the, um, that the, the messages that work are simple, then great. You don't have to read the rest of the book, uh, you know, because it's a 208 page book about saying things simply. It really seems like I didn't take my own advice as part of that. <laughs> uh, but once you peel back the layers on it, it starts to be really interesting. And you, mm. you 
can look at the so the book is the why and the how, right? The why part of this. Um, okay, so why is simple so important? Uh, it basically comes down to this idea of fluency. Uh, fluency, it's a word, you know, you and I know the word fluency. It, it, you can be fluent in English or or Spanish or Mandarin or, or you know, wine or cooking. You can be fluent in a lot of different things. Where we're fluent, things are easy, right? They flow. That's where the original uh, word comes from. Uh, but from a cognitive science perspective, the word fluency, it, it actually has a little bit of a deeper meaning also, which which is it's, it means that it's easier to take something from yeah. out in the world stick it in your head and make sense of it. Right. Um, yeah. And that's more, that's, that's fluent. The things that are easier to do all that too, easier to see, perceive, understand those are fluent. And the things that aren't, um, are not fluent. And to the things that are fluent, we are more likely to trust them, more likely to like them, more likely to buy them across the whole range of, of studies and, um, and different attributes. All of the positive stuff is associated with fluency. And if things are, harder if they take more sweat if they take more time more effort for us to get into our heads and make sense of it we don't like them we don't mm -hmm. we don't trust them we don't buy them and when you're in the business of marketing that's really not what you want well and it's it's and by the way this uh this i was opening an email from you uh or email i sent to you this you reminded me of actually what the other story was that i really liked the story of the uh new york stock exchange ticker symbols Oh, yeah. And how the simpler ticker, ticker symbols actually performed better over time compared to the more complicated ones. And it just being this really great illustration of this concept of fluency. And I think for everybody listening, this is also a really easily understandable concept in the sense of when you, when you transition from marketing to actually the sales conversation, like think about when someone has to take eight different steps to actually buy from you they're less likely to buy versus someone who can easily buy in a moment. I'm thinking even like simply put like on a, on, on a website, like when you have four pages mm -hmm. to click through and it's also why Amazon, by the way, I mean, they love their patent for the one, the one click buy option because uh, people buy when it's simple. Right. So this concept of fluency is, is um, pretty brilliant. I really enjoy this. Uh, but when you're a marketer, and, and let's actually just move away from the term marketer, because I mean, everyone listening who's a self self started entrepreneur, business owner, I mean, you are marketing your business. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's tough. It's tough to make it simple. And I, I think everyone listening would be like, I want to make it simple, but it's hard, especially if you're going like to an event where you're pitching your business, like a networking event, or you're promoting your business, and like you want to say all the amazing things that you do and like why it's so great, and like here's here's why we're different. And and it ends up being this jumbled mess of, you know, it's like the Michael Scott um, quote where he's like, sometimes I start a sentence and I don't even know. Um, at least that's that's the point, the position that I found myself in sometimes, especially early on in my business is like, how do I really simplify this thing? And it's mm -hmm. it can be very challenging. Oh, yeah, because complexity or complication is easy to hide behind. That's one of the reasons why it is so uh, appealing. I've gone into meetings in my career. I know everybody else has done this where you just, sometimes you just have your stuff, right? Sometimes you don't have the answer. Sometimes it's a tough question and you need to just get through it. And so what do you do? You drop as much jargon, as many mm -hmm. buzzwords, as many acronyms as you can. And hopefully that wall of sound will wow yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the other side enough that you can get out of there and you can escape. Uh, that's, uh, hey, that's just what we do. That's what you see that in politics, you see that in, in business, uh -huh. uh, is that the more you can kind of just like filibuster your way through something. And and so you mentioned the, um, the user experience piece of this, and that was actually a large um, part of, of what I was looking at as I was going for this, this, this project was my background is in design, right? That that's, that's what I would that's where I came from is, is doing design and uh, user interface, user experience. And I wanted to look at this problem from a design lens. Uh, and if you go towards the end of the book there, I start talking about minimal, you know, uh, effective messages are minimal. And what that means is everything you need, but only what you need. Mm. Um, and that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean the fewest number of words or the fewest number of sentences, paragraphs, pages, slides, web pages, it means the least amount of friction, 
Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're operating on here is all those, you could have more words, it could be longer and it could be smoother because of that. Uh, But, you know, if you look at this, you mentioned Amazon, if in an e-commerce setting, when money is directly on the line, we get it, right? Like if you ever go buy something, as soon as you get to that next page, we have to enter your credit card information. What happens to the rest of the site? Everything melts off of it, right? There's no more, there's no more tabs. There's no more privacy policy and, and about us. Everything just becomes, hey, go enter your credit card information right here. Because everything else, that's a distraction. That's an off-ramp, right? That's a way for us to go back and go do something else. Uh, and in our communications, if that is a slogan, if that is an email, if that is a presentation, we want to make sure we do the same thing, which is if we have something we want people to get. To, to inform them about something, to persuade them about something. We want to eliminate reasons for them to, to have friction on that journey. Yeah. So like for the small business owner, what are some other examples of friction? Like are these, um, is this like a lack of clarity or transparency around like price? Is it a lack of transparency around like process? Um, Cause I'm, I'm seeing, I know we're having a marketing conversation, but I can't help, but think about the sales piece of it and like where i mean ultimately where the rubber meets the road like where you're actually mm-hmm. trying to shift your your business in a healthy direction um but i really resonate with that word friction because i think you're right i think i think the there's a there's a um not misnomer that's not what i'm thinking of misconception around um thinking simple or even the word you use minimal has to mean the shortest and I love that you drew the distinction with we're, we're talking friction here, friction with your buyer or your user, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm curious what other examples might might be included in that. Oh, that's that's a great one. I mean, some of the things. I mean, you mentioned pricing. I think pricing is a is a place that a lot of businesses stumble on, uh, which is just not being direct about it. Yeah, actually, you know who's really bad about pricing is. is is customers and clients are really bad about pricing. Uh, this is a slight aside, but I remember every time we would pitch a project, we would, um, there's two things that really matter, right? There's two things. There's the timeline and there's the budget. Those are the frameworks mm-hmm. that if, you, if those aren't possible, it doesn't matter where else is there. You can't do it. Uh, the, but clients are a little bit cagey about some of those a lot of times. And so uh, we had a little bit of a magic weapon with it, which was, it was this one sentence which is, okay, can you give us any guide, guidance in terms of timeline, in terms of budget on this project? And a client's going to come back every single time and they're going to tell you, uh, you know, they're going to answer the timeline question first. And they're going to say 50% of the time, some sort of joke of, ha we need it yesterday or we yeah. need it tomorrow. Or <laughs> and you got to go laugh that off. You roll your eyes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so, so that's uh, eventually you get the, the time, you get the schedule from them. And then the budget, most of the time they're going to come back and they're going to say, well, we don't, we don't really have a budget right now. We're trying to figure it yeah. out. We want. Everybody has a budget. Everybody has a budget. And you know they may not know what their budget is consciously, but they subconsciously know what their budget is. So we would ask, well, the reason I'm asking you this question is not because I want to get the bottom dollar out of you, every penny out of you. It's because there's a different solution for $5,000, for $50,000, and for $500,000. And I just want to make sure we're in the same ballpark in terms of what we're putting together. Mm-hmm. And, and as soon as you say that, people know immediately where they are. If for, there's there's something about putting those numbers out there that it's this tangible thing people latch onto, uh, and they come back and they say, "Well, you know, this project we have a hundred thousand for it. Oh, well, no, we definitely don't have that. We have we have three thousand for it." Immediately, they they know what their their budget is. They may not have a specific line item for it, but they know what order of magnitude they want to be at. Uh, so th- this was a slight tangent from your question, but I thought it was also something interesting to share. No, well, it makes me think of, you know, especially like in the sales conversation, I think, I think when we talk about like being, being specific, being simple, being clear, there is a fear. If I'm too clear, I'm going to lose the sale. Like I'm going to mm-hmm. lose the customer. And instead of seeing these things as things that can empower your brand, we see them as things to avoid because it's it is exclusive or like even i was talking to a guy we were having an early conversation he had just started his business and i said well what like let's talk about like the niching conversation like who's your customer and he was like well i mean everyone everyone's my customer and i was oh, like man yeah but like from like a, a strategy point like what who do you want to go after and he was like there, there's too much opportunity like i can't i can't segment it 
And I think sometimes that happens in sales where it's like, it's like, I don't want to say, I don't want to narrow it too much. I don't want to be too minimal because that might, it might exclude people who could have been my customer. And I mean, you were in business for a decade. I mean, you obviously know the power of brand and figuring out who your buyer is, who your customer is, but more importantly, getting very comfortable with that and getting comfortable with people who, frankly, I mean, we're talking about $3,000 versus $100,000. I mean, there's you probably got inquiries from people who they were like, I got a couple hundred bucks. And you're like, how did you get my email, first of all? But <laughs> you know, understanding like not everyone can be your customer. It feels like that's a bit of a friction point when it comes to like your messaging is like, I'm scared of losing opportunities rather than embracing who you really are. 100%, right? The, um, if you're everything for everybody, you're nothing for nobody, right? It's, it's a big challenge. Uh, especially when I talk to young folks that are, that are just starting their business, they have the, the exact perspective attitude statement that you just said which is that we're kind of for everybody and, hmm. and you, you can't you can be but you shouldn't be because listen coca-cola <laughs> is for everybody i get it right but you're not coca-cola right uh, and this the, by the way i love this when someone throws yeah. out something like that and i'm like are, yeah. are you gonna be the are you, are you running a billion plus a trillion yeah, exactly. dollar brand you know so anyway continue though oh yeah it's like are you the outlier because yeah, yeah um, right <laughs> the uh the thing about um, so one thing that is a very simple question that is very difficult for a lot of folks uh, are the kind of three basic questions of uh, positioning. So there's I talk about positioning a little bit in the book, but uh, it's more so to kind of make things tangible. Uh, positioning as a brand is answering just three questions. It is, who are you for? Who's your customer? What problem do they have that you solve? And then why are you better? than everybody mm. else is solving that problem. I will tell you right now, I have sat with businesses that have done millions and millions of dollars that have uh, people that have worked there for decades and they can't answer these questions about their business that they spent every waking hour doing. Mm. Um, it's because they just it's easy when you're in it to not, to not think about that. Uh, and when we would do a branding project of a client, that would be more valuable than any design output or whatever that you give them the the kind of business therapy session of sitting there and, and getting all your stakeholders in one room and saying okay who's your customer you know and and what problem do they have that you're solving uh, and then again why are you better than everybody else is having that problem let, let, you let's might talk get about, one or two of those but people can't get all of them it's for some reason let, let's talk about that third one for a second and we're also we're coming to the end of our our conversation um, th this third one, why, why are you better? Or the way I see it come up a lot is, um, cause I go to a lot of different events. I'm talking to a lot of different business owners and I always hear, yeah. And here's how we're different from everybody else. And, and the, only, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with that line. It's just that what then follows is, is something very like, Hey, we're, for example, we're, here's how we're different. We give great customer service. And it's yeah, like, it's like it's they're like, not well, different in their difference at that point, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so, or or it's such like a jargony, like highly, like, hey, we're different because we have a special process that we, you know, and they name out like all this terminology, and you're kind of like, oh, okay, yeah. But it, it doesn't feel like businesses have really figured out. And 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 just speaking for myself, I don't even know if I figured this mm -hmm. out. Like when it comes to like podcasting, when it comes to um seo when it comes to just like business consulting like i'm always asking myself this question not not how am i different but in a customer's eyes what would they see as being different about me mm -hmm. um and i i i'll be honest man i oscillate from like oh yeah i i, I can see that too I have no freaking clue how I'm different, you know? And so, and I guess part of this is like, you talk to your customers and kind of figure that out, but um, I'd love to, I'd love to get your wisdom on this third question for a second. Oh yeah. That's the hardest one, right? Cause it's relatively easy to be like, okay, I'm targeting, you know, homeowners and the zip code yeah. and you know, it shouldn't be as boring as that. It's a bit more poetic, <laughs> but the, the last question, I'll tell you what our answer was as, as a way of answering them. Uh, when we, we, when we ran our agency, we we wanted to do great work. We we generally did do great work. We hired excellent people that were talented and people knew their stuff. Um, but a lot of agencies can do great work. A lot of people can do great work. Uh, that's almost in many ways like table stakes. Uh, but what we wanted to do was we wanted their weekly meeting with us to be their favorite meeting on the calendar. 
That's that's what our goal was. Mm. We wanted to be the the contractor, the supplier, the vendor that they were the most excited to work with. The ones that if they were at like the holiday party and we were there, they would hang out with us. Mm. We wanted to be the the a pleasure to work with um as as our main differentiating factor. And to open the call, we talked a little bit about how I'll sit down with a client for an hour and half of it is kind of shooting the shit. Mm -hmm. That was strategic because first of all, I enjoyed it and I genuinely liked the people we worked with, but also they're going to spend a lot of time with us and we want them to enjoy that time. And we mm -hmm. would introduce that idea early on in the process of the sales pitch, which is you're going to spend a lot of time with your agency. You better like the people you're working with. Mm -hmm. Introduce that as a criteria in their selection. And then by virtue of us making sure that we were good people, hopefully, and we also hire good people, that we would bring that promise to life. You know, it's funny too. And it's funny you keep saying things that I'm like, oh yeah, we gotta talk more about that. But then I'm like, you know, we gotta, we gotta crunch this thing in. We gotta end this thing. But I love, you know, what I was thinking about as you were talking was the a very common concept that almost everyone knows about, the no like and trust factor. Um, it, I and this is honestly the bread and butter of the podcast. It's like we're talking about these very tangible things. So what I've seen happen is people they take a concept like no like and trust, and there's someone they that is their customer, or they want them to be their customer, and so they're like you know, Hey, how was your Monday? Or it's like, whatever is like the canned, you know, mm -hmm. question, like, how was your weekend or like Mondays? Right. And the person gives the response and they say, Oh, I was out of town. And instead of like leaning in and being like, Oh, where'd you go? Or like, Oh, you had a family vacation. Oh, like, how was that? Like, what was the occasion? It's Oh, great. Cool. And then they sort of like check the box of like, yeah, I did the no like and trust thing. I nailed it. And like, it's like, I don't know the expression. I don't know if I'm smart enough to think of like what I'm really what the expression for this is, but you're talking about like, no, no, we're talking about the actual, like tangible things you do to build the no like and trust factor versus just, I did it. I asked the question, um, mm -hmm. which I really like. So, oh, yeah, you know, I appreciate it. We, we, it's also fun on our end because the same way that they would spend a lot of time with us, we would spend a lot of time with them and we only wanted to work with people we enjoyed. Uh, and so we we purposely sought that out, and and I know I I know what you're talking about because it's basically like these people are just following a HubSpot script of like okay, well, yes, I go check the box of like who happy birthday. Yes. But we right. we genuinely cared uh, about the folks we work with to the point where we went to their weddings. Sometimes we, um, you I know, love that. I still yes. keep years to a year and a half after we sold the business. I still see and and sometimes socialize and and you know they came to my event the other night. Folks that we worked with, um, and it it really uh, it, it's just more fun. It's but it's better for business. It's more fun to, to right. be like that. Yeah. Well, Ben, we we are out of time. Um, as much as I want to keep going, this is great. Uh, for our listeners who are listening, so um, I, I, you guys listening, I want you to buy the book. Uh, it's you, is is the best place on your website, or would you prefer elsewhere? Um, I mean, the website will link over to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, okay. you know, Porchlight, all the different folks that all the different places you can buy books. You can buy the book. So the book is called Simply Put. Um, it's a great looking book too, by the way, but you guys can go to bingutman.com. Again, it's two T's, two N's. It's actually in the description of this episode. There's a link to Ben's website. Uh, and then Ben, for people who are listening, who they're like, I gotta, I gotta engage more with this guy. Like I gotta learn more or buy from this guy and get some help for my own business. W what's the next step? Oh, I appreciate that. Blake. This has been a ton of fun and I would totally do this every day. This is, this is a great conversation. Um, <laughs> You can again. You can find me at bengutman.com. I appreciate the shout out for that. Uh, there's a free chapter download. You can go. You can go grab there if you want to preview the book. Um, I send out an email every Tuesday. That is just three simple things, and it's an article I wrote, something I found, and an idea. Uh, and then finally, if you want even more from me, you can go find me on LinkedIn. Uh, again, it's just Ben Gutman. Okay, Ben. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Blake. This has been a blast. Hey, for our listeners, if you're listening to the podcast and you enjoy the podcast, what the heck are you waiting on? Click the subscribe or follow button so you can keep getting good advice wherever you are. Also, don't forget, if you are an amazing business, you want to advertise on the podcast, you can always shoot me an email at blake at goodadvicecoaching.com, where we'll shout out your business like the ones you've heard at the intro to the podcast. And don't forget, we do have a Patreon where you can support the podcast for as little as the price of a cup of coffee, which these days, I guess, could be anything, but it's about $5 a month, <laughs> so cheaper than a cup of coffee. You can go to patreon.com slash goodadvice. We appreciate those of you who sponsor the podcast and support the podcast. And more importantly, we love helping small 
small business owners like you do business better. All that to say, that's today's good advice. We'll catch you later. See ya.